Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Thursday, February 18th, we're studying Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 26. Jesus heals a blind man in Bethsaida, but he accomplishes this miracle in two stages. What might that unusual action of Jesus teach us about the Christian faith and discipleship? We will explore themes like that today. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Ryan Agrotowitz. Pastor Agrotowitz serves as Associate Pastor and Headmaster at Grace Lutheran Church and School in Brenham, Texas. Pastor Agrotowitz, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Pastor Apple, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. We find ourselves in the middle of Mark chapter 8 today, Pastor Agrotowitz. In terms of context, as we think about the gospel of Mark, this particular part, what do we need to know going into this text? Right. Well, in, it's in chapter 8, we know, and chapter 8 begins with Jesus' feeding of the 4,000. And after that text, we go to the Pharisees. They are demanding a sign, and Jesus will warn his disciples about the, the leaven of the Pharisees, their teaching. Okay. And after that warning, we begin to our text, the proper text for today that we're studying, which is the healing at Bethsaida. Um, I'd like to say some comments, too, overall about, about the Gospel of Mark. Um, maybe overlooked is a strong term, but I, I, I do remember a professor saying that Mark was, you know, if you look at the history of church writers and theologians and so forth, it's the gospel that hasn't always gotten a lot of press, um, and in some sense is overshadowed by, by Matthew and Luke, because they just, they contain some things that we, we enjoy hearing, such as, you know, the visit of the, the Magi and the Gospel of Matthew. Luke has all these liturgical elements in it, you know, we get the Magnificat, the Song of Simeon, uh, Zachariah's song, the Annunciation, and all these things. Um, but Mark is a distinct gospel that has a lot of uh, elements to it that we should, as Christians, of course, pay attention to. And one is, it's a gospel that moves very fast in transitioning from one event to another. I remember in seminary learning the uh, the term immediately in the Greek, it shows up quite a bit, especially in the front part of Mark. Immediately Jesus did this, immediately he did that. Uh, it starts off with the proclamation of Isaiah, uh, the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, and then we see John baptizing, then there's Jesus' baptism, and it just has this quick feel about it. And there's certainly strong teaching in the Gospel of Mark, but also the acts of Jesus are going to be highlighted. And that's going to fall into our discussion today. Of course, we're dealing with the uh, the miracle at Bethsaida. And also, we need to talk about, too, why is it in Mark that Jesus wants some people to keep quiet about it? So that would be some general comments on the Gospel of Mark. And, of course, the context, it, he just got done warning his disciples about the leaven of the Pharisees, and here we go, we're in Bethsaida, and a healing is going to happen. The, the I think the context is, is going to be very important with talking about the leaven of the Pharisees in the previous text, and the fact that the disciples clearly don't get it. The closing words of the previous text are Jesus' question, do you not yet understand? And given that conversation that they have on the boat there in that part of chapter 8, they clearly don't understand and, and I think that that sort of attention that's there about the lack of understanding for the disciples, particularly in the way that Mark has laid his gospel out, as you said, he moves very quickly from one thing to the other, using that word immediately so often. That word immediately we're going to see, and we've already started to see it a little bit, is not going to show up quite as much as we move forward in the gospel according to St. Mark. And, and in today's text, I think it's even more striking. It's, it's absent, by the way, the word immediately is. In the fact, though, that the miracle that Jesus does, it doesn't actually happen immediately. He, 
it's going to happen in in two stages and you're almost you know we'll talk more about this when we get there i know but you know jesus is going to to heal the man and he's going to say do you see anything and it's like well sort of and then he does something else and he gets full healing and you're you know if you, you're reading along in mark and jesus has been doing things immediately here and there his word is is proving effective not for the disciples as well as you would think and here comes this man for healing and it happens in stages and you're, I mean, you're kind of left scratching your head a little bit. This text stands out. And I think really is a part of that, you know, as you're saying, we shouldn't overlook Mark because here's one of those very unique contributions of Mark in just the way he structures it and the inclusion of this miracle that I think invites us to slow down a little bit and really consider what he's doing here. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. I, I love this text that we're studying today. When, when I, when I saw this assignment, I was excited because it's just, it has this, this, at least to our reason, our sensibilities, this odd characteristic about it, you know, that just makes us lean in a little more to the text and what is going on? You know, he's seeing trees, what? And those can be good questions when we begin to probe the depths of Holy Scripture and we want to find more. Uh, I mean, sometimes we come up empty-handed, sometimes the more we dig, the more we find, and, and God be praised for that. You know, I, and I like what you said about right here, it's like you don't see the word immediately, and it's following on the heels of Jesus' question, do you not yet understand? And, you know, you'd asked for a context question from me, and what I failed to mention, what comes after the healing at the side of which that's important as well, because then you have Peter's great confession of Jesus being the Christ, and then right after that, and this occurs in Matthew as well, Peter rebukes Jesus when he talks about suffering many things, being rejected and killed, and that's when Jesus has that line, get behind me, Satan. So clearly there, Peter still doesn't understand everything. He goes from confessing to now attempting to thwart Jesus from ascending to the cross, and Jesus calls him Satan. No uncertain terms there. Then comes the transfiguration text, and after the transfiguration text, we again, we see the disciples there. They're trying to do an exorcism. It's not working. Jesus comes down there, and he says a line in verse 29, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. So he will do what the disciples cannot. So there's plenty surrounding this text today, highlighting the disciples, where they're following, they're hearing, but they're just not getting it. And we can talk more about that as we dive into this text. Yeah, and I think the way you, you bring out that following context really helps to, to highlight this text is a, a bit of a transitional text that, that really does provide a hinge between what we've seen before and the lack of understanding from the disciples. And then going forward, how there are these moments where they start to get it, but they still haven't fully. And so this text, I think, in that way, functions as a bit of a transition within the narrative of Mark's gospel. So the text is Mark 8, beginning at verse 22. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. That's the text for today, Mark eight twenty-two through 26. So, Pastor Grotowitz, let's just set the scene to get started. They're in Bethsaida. Where are we in Israel? Why is the location brought out right here? Right. The location, I would say, is important is because it's in the northern part of Israel. And so if you recall the northern part of Israel, and we're talking like north of the Sea of Galilee, the north, of course, was the first uh, kingdom to fall. If you go read the Old Testament, when they're, the kingdom is divided, you know, right after Solomon's reign, Rehoboam takes the south, Jeroboam gets the north, and then it, it's just a, a foul, fall, the bouncy ball, really, of all the kings that come and go. But the northern kingdom is going to fall to the Assyrians, and of course it is, it is repopulated, and then by the time Jesus comes on the scene in the New Testament, the northern area, the Samaritans, as they are called, are not seen as your, your real, pure, authentic Jews, if you will. Plus, the northern kingdom didn't have the critical place where you went to worship, which would have been the temple. 
So this is the territory where Jesus is in. Again, Bethsaida is on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. So that's always important when you see Jesus, you know, doing his ministry in those regions and areas. Um, he's also close to some of the other regions beyond even the Pale of Israel. Uh, and Mark has that, that record of the Syrophoenician woman who comes to him. So there are even some Gentiles who are going to encounter Christ and his teaching, and, and that's good in the sense we see the proclamation exceeding the boundaries of Israel, going beyond those who are just of Jewish blood. That's where Bethsaida is at, and, um, you know, especially given the the uh, the Jews who looked at Samaritans and saw them as not worthy or a little more impure than me, it is a great blessing to see the Lord working in those regions still, that He loves all people, He dies for all people. Um, you may claim to be a child of Abraham by your bloodline, but guess what? God can from stones raise children of Abraham. And so there's a lot there just packed in the word beside him, seeing its location up in the north. Another tidbit of information that might be interesting, uh, the term Bethsaida, that city, also occurs in Luke chapter 9 when he is uh, feeding 5,000. The city shows up there. So um, it is a significant place in Scripture, both its location and uh, at least two great miracles, the feeding of 5,000 and this particular healing are going to occur at this place. And we also know from John chapter 1 that Bethsaida is the hometown of Philip. Also, John tells us also the city of Andrew and Peter. So, and what's interesting about that is you're, you're giving the location, you know, there's a bit of a, maybe a, a mixture there where on the one hand, we know that there's a, certainly faithful Jews who are from this town, and yet it's in an area where there's going to be some of that a mixture of a religion that, as you said, traces its history all the way back to the division of the kingdom and then the, the Syrian conquest and all of the, the importing of foreign people that happens. Sure. And so, you know, I mean, we're, we're back in that context and we've seen Jesus kind of bouncing back and forth a little bit here in the previous chapters between more strictly Jewish territory and strictly Gentile territory. And here he's in a location where there's a, a bit of ambiguity in that. So you're kind of wondering what's, what's going to happen here. Again, we know thinking through the context, ironically, it seems that Jesus has found a lot more faithful responses to his work and his teaching in the Gentile areas than he has in the strictly Jewish areas, particularly given what we've just seen in the, the previous set of texts where the Pharisees come with unbelief demanding a sign and the disciples have the hardness of heart. There, Jesus is dealing very strictly Jewish territory and he's met with that. Here we've got him sort of in this mixed bag. The question is... Be, you know, just from that location, like, okay, well, what's what's going to happen here? And, and maybe with that scene being set like that, it really helps to, you know, we're not maybe as surprised when we see the way that this miracle actually plays out in terms that, well, it sort of worked and then it needs to be finished. And so we're, we're in that kind of area where what's what's going to happen? That's that's the scene. Now, I, I think that, you know, again, as, as the text continues, we get some echoes from previous texts that the way that this progressed, we've got people bringing to Jesus someone who's in need. You know, we saw that back in Mark chapter two, where very famously the the four friends uh, bring their paralytic friend and, and lower him down through the roof. We also saw it back in Mark chapter seven, where you have a man who is deaf and mute, who is brought to Jesus. They're begging Jesus to touch him. Again, there's another theme. And now we're gonna see Jesus actually take this man and, and lead him away privately. So and we've seen this before too. So help us into some of these details that we're seeing again, uh, but just why are these details important? Sure. Well, let, let's talk, let, let's just take it one by one. First, the people are bringing a blind man to Jesus, begging him to touch him. This is good for the blind man. So here's a person in need, he cannot see. Um, and so people are going to take him, and so he is going to be really a passive, a passive object, a passive partner, if you will, in this, and that he is brought to Christ, and Christ is going to heal him, thanks to the goodwill of these people. Uh, another scene in the Gospels when the men are trying to drop a paralytic through the roof. So just because somebody cannot actively get to Christ, it's good to see neighbors, Christian people, you know, rise up and, and do that. Yeah, that's chapter 2, where the, uh, the man is dropped through the roof. So they bring him, he is blind, and they want Jesus just to touch him, uh, that, that shows, I think, an indication of their belief in Jesus, that they at the very least believe that if he just lays his hands on 
the blind man, uh, he will be made well. You know, what more they did believe about Jesus, that's, that's I would say, a, a little bit of conjecture. We don't want to go too far down that path. But they are right to think that bringing him to Christ, and if Jesus does, you know, just lays his hands on him, perhaps a miracle will happen. And, and they're begging, they're begging Jesus to touch him. So that that's the scene in terms of getting the blind man to him. But another a, a detail, you know, why why does he take him out of the village? Okay, mm-hmm. um, you, you know, I would think the village would be the place to do a miracle, right? You're in front of people, they can all see it, and that's that's what... That's what God needs, right? A, a fan club and an audience, and so do it. Do it in the village square. But that's not what the Lord does. He takes them away uh, privately to uh, you know, administer this healing, and He does it by spit, spits, and He He puts a spit on His eyes and so forth. Before I, I quite get to that point, why He takes it out of the village could be because we have seen it in the Gospel of Mark how the crowds have reacted, and it's just not always favorable. Um, maybe I do think that, you know, doing it in a village square would be a good idea, but the crowd's reaction to Jesus is not always positive, and there are some moments in Mark where they, they're a real threat to Jesus' ministry, just because of the, the, the ecstasy and the frenzy that they have over Jesus and the miracles that he is doing. So we see this um, in in Mark chapter 1, this happens, when he he the Lord Jesus will tell he says, don't say anything to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and the healing of a leper. But what does the guy do? He goes out and begins to talk freely about it, to spread the news so Jesus could no longer openly enter a town. Okay. Now, that's not good, because now he can't go into the town and he cannot preach. Another place in the Gospel of Mark would be um, chapter 3, where Jesus tells the disciples... Uh, to have a boat ready for him, lest they, the crowd, crush him. And then in uh, Mark 3.20, the crowds began to gather in the text uh, so that they could not even eat. So we've seen instances of the crowd's response being not good for the ministry and work of Jesus. So maybe if we take that data and apply it here, it could be he wants him out of the village because he doesn't need another miracle to put the crowd in a frenzy, so much so they miss they miss who Jesus is. They miss why he came. He is not some magical miracle worker where you just get a, a quick fix to your problem and go about your way. But these miracles and signs have an important point and purpose, which is to testify to the divinity and even the work of Christ, his chief work, which is to save sinners. The miracles are good, they're very helpful. No doubt the blind man receiving his sight rejoiced over being able to see. That's a great gift. But that gift radically fails in comparison to the forgiveness of sins and the eternal life the Lord has secured for you. And even a miracle can get in the way of that if your intent of following and looking to Jesus is just to get healing here and now. Uh, That's not the point and could be the reason the Lord Jesus wants him away from the village before he does the miracle. Hmm. In the book of Hebrews, the last chapter, the writer there talks about Jesus being crucified outside of the city, even even to the point that in Hebrews 13, 13, he writes, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. And, and I wonder, and I mean, I know that, you know, Mark and Hebrews, they're doing two different things, but I wonder if there's, there's perhaps even just with with what's going on here in Mark eight and the, the danger that the crowd sometimes poses to the mission of Jesus, ultimately that mission being to go to the cross. If there's not something, a bit of a a foreshadow or a foretaste of what's going to happen to Jesus, that his own ultimate sign, if I can, and I know Mark doesn't have the quote signs like John does, and he even refused the sign, but that the place where Jesus is going to reveal himself fully and where he wants to be fully seen is actually not going to be in the village or in the city, but it is going to be outside when he's crucified. And it's there that the centurion finally confesses upon seeing mm-hmm. Jesus die. That's the son of God. Such that, again, we talked about this as a bit of a, a transitional text. You know, maybe that's something else that we could see in Jesus taking him outside the village. Yeah, right, right. And I had not thought about that, but there, there's a lot there that certainly contemplate when looking at 
in Mark chapter 8. You know, the, the culmination of Mark, if you will, is going to be the crucifixion. And the centurion's confession, uh, you know, back up a bit, if you go throughout Mark, and you're reading Mark, and any reader can do this, you keep seeing Jesus telling people to be quiet, even the demons to be quiet. You see this numerous times. Um, and then finally, at the cross, yes, uh, 1539, that's in the centurion, truly you are the Son of God. Okay, And it, it, it just fits so perfectly to, to read all of this and say, that's the moment that we just really need to pay attention to. That is the moment in Mark where it's, it's just like the, the aha moment. Ah, now this is who he is. But he just died. <laughs> you know, there is the body hanging on the cross, bloody, uh, whipped, scourged, a, a, a body just that is a wreck. And that's when the centurion confesses who he is. This being in line with St. Paul and the rather famous dictum of his in 1 Corinthians 2, I desire to know nothing but Christ and him what? Crucified. So, yeah, outside the village, that's where the action is going to happen. Um, what I mean by that is what you brought up. It's going to be outside Jerusalem, where the crucified Christ, there is our Lord, there is our God, atoning for the sins of the world. Here we see this miracle happening outside the village, and, and perhaps that is a prompting for us to think about the work, the chief work that's going to take place. So here Jesus is doing a miracle, and he is not trying to get attention from the people. You, you know, he's not, he's not one of these cult leaders who loves attention and wants more people, the more the merrier, so to speak. The public proclamation about who Jesus is is going to go out. But the time is not yet. There's some things that he has to do, namely his crucifixion and his resurrection. And I want to go a little more into that, but that's, that's, that kind of uh, you know, dovetails into the end of this text when he says, do not even enter the village. And I think there's some things we should talk about you know, before we get to that point. Sure. So, and again, before we get to that point, one of the things that stands out about this miracle is the way in which Jesus accomplishes it. And so we saw this, although maybe not quite as graphic. It says, when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him. Previously, Jesus had, had used spit for the man who was deaf and mute. Here, I mean, the picture that I have in my mind is Jesus you know, standing face to face with this guy, and he actually spits on his eyes. Not that he like spits on his fingers and then touches his eyes, but he actually spits on his eyes, which is, and that just looks gross. And in any other context, probably would have been taken as, as quite the insult, perhaps, which, you know, at least from a, a very surface level thing, it kind of makes sense that Jesus takes him out of the village if he knows that's how he's going to do it. Because, I mean, if you saw somebody spit on another guy, you probably would get upset. I think I would. This is how Jesus chooses to do it. Very, I mean, again, strange to our eyes. I think there's more to talk about here with that, the spit. <laughs> it's, it's not what you would expect. No, no. Spit is disgusting. And if, if you're just reading, I mean, the text says what it says, right? He had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him. So it sounds very much like he just spit and then laid his hands, maybe rubbed it in the eyes. I mean, um, but it's spit we're dealing with. Uh, the Lord is wholly perfect and without sin. And the Lord, the way he does these miracles, spitting, spitting, mixing with mud, or just speaking, and it is so. We see the miracles accomplished in a variety of ways. And, you know, in one sense, I don't think we should spend a lot of time trying to, to, to formulate a pattern on how the Lord does miracles. He works how he works. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Using spit seems disgusting to us, insignificant. And yet, by his, his will to heal this guy, the guy receives his sight. So I think there is a strong sacramental connection to this, and that you see here in this text the Lord working through something that we think is pretty despicable. But the reason why we think things in creation are despicable are we see them affected by sin. I mean, spit is disgusting. Before the fall, before the plunge into sin, there was no problem with it. Um, uh, of course, again, just to reiterate, the Lord is without sin, of course. But even things like bread, water, and wine that we see in the sacraments the Lord has instituted, they, they just look so insignificant to us. I mean, why, you know, why would God choose to do something miraculous through these things? 
and yet he does. He says all sorts of things about baptism and the Lord's Supper, and the elements are what they are, bread, water, and wine, which are not impressive things to the senses. Indeed, we take them for granted um, for a variety of reasons, and yet God chooses to work through them. And when you see how God operates through means, material means matter, and this goes you know, deep back into the Old Testament. I would argue even the tree of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the Lord declaring these trees to be what they were, and indeed they were. You see God speaking through a burning bush to Moses. You see God, of course, descend upon Mount Sinai. My goodness, the book of Leviticus has all sorts of holy objects. There's even a phrase there called holy things. You know, these these constructed items made of matter, and yet God declares them to be holy uh, the Ark, you know, it, the Ark was a, an extremely holy, holy object of Israel. There's even the account of a man dying named Uzzah when he tries to steady it when it's, uh, you know, coming into the city. And so the idea of God working through things matter to do great things is not foreign at all to Holy Scripture. By the time you get to this point, even, I mean, even spit, yes, uh, that's uh, almost offensive to our own flesh and sensibilities, but this is the way the Lord has chosen to work, and he does something great through it. And the lesson might be here for us is, too, when God works through something and he says that's how he's going to work, our response to it, our thoughts about it, should always fall a distant, a far distant second to what God has said about it. We should say amen and be faithful. And to the guy who receives his sight, he had no care in the world about spit. The point was he had received what the Lord had given him, and that's that's good. For sure. We want to keep our eyes focused on what Jesus said. Eyes focused on what Jesus said. Here mm-hmm. first before you see. We're going to keep dwelling on that here on Sharp Iron on the other side of the break. We've got Pastor Ryan Agrotowitz looking at Mark chapter 8 with us this morning. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Since 1978, Lutheran Church Extension Fund has had the humble privilege of supporting Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries and her workers. Thanks to faithful investors, LCEF has provided thousands of church workers, congregations, schools, and organizations with the low-cost loans and resources they need to reach more people with the saving name of Christ. To learn more, visit lcef.org or call 800-843-5233. 800-843-5233. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Thursday, February 18th. We're looking at Mark chapter 8, verses 22 through 26. We have Pastor Ryan Agrado. It's with us. He serves as associate pastor and headmaster at Grace Lutheran Church and School in Brenham, Texas. Pastor Agrado, before the break, we were talking about this matter of Jesus spitting on the man, which seems rather disgusting to us, but it is how the Lord chooses to work. And you're talking about how throughout the Old Testament, you have these items that are just you know regular plain things and yet because the lord has declared them so they are in fact holy and that focus upon god's word and the way that he works through the the things the stuff that we actually touch in this world is is just fantastic and this i think really connects well to the way we've seen jesus work so often in the gospel of mark where he does touch things or people Often things are people that he really shouldn't have touched. And and what you see is how the holiness that belongs to Jesus is so powerful that instead of the unclean thing or person making him unclean, rather it goes the other way. His holiness goes to that person. And, and how much more striking of an image could you have than actually his spit, because it is the Lord's spit, being something that conveys that holiness, conveys that healing. And as as you were talking prior to the break, you're talking about how, how important it is to keep our, our focus on what the Lord has said. And and you mentioned the sacraments, at least. I'd like you to, to dig into that a little bit more to, to move from this text and what this reminds us and teaches us about what the Lord gives us in the sacraments that we have today. Yeah, sure. So I think the theme I would I would drive home in this is what has God said 
what he said and keep your eyes on that and your ears on that and not judge by your reason and your senses. The spit is, you know, it's God's spit, as you just mentioned. And so it is coming from God. It is good, not tainted by sin. And that's how the Lord chose to work. That's the means he uses to, to heal this man and give him sight. Now, we see a lot of similarities to that in something like holy baptism, for example, where the scriptures say, now baptism saves you. Um, and in those waters, the Word of God and all of His promises are there. They're there in that water. So when you're looking at a font and a baby being baptized, so the senses, you know, it's not all that impressive. You see a pastor, you see the baby, and you see some water. And if you were to judge based on that, it's easy to conclude something to the effect of, well, that's just not all that important. I can take or leave that. What's a little water? It's just a ceremony, custom, and so forth. And people do make those judgments as opposed to reading something like Romans chapter 6 and hearing that in baptism you're united to the death and resurrection of Christ, or understanding what it means when in baptism God's name is spoken, that this is the name of salvation we're talking about here. I mean, when Jesus is baptized, uh, the Father speaks, this is my Son, the Holy Spirit des- descends as a dove, and so you see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit there at the baptism of Jesus, all these wonderful things the Lord's Supper is another example. What do we have there? Bread and wine. But what does God say about it? If we were to judge by our senses, it would just seem as pretty insignificant and trite. But this is my body, this is my blood, for the forgiveness of sins, he is saying. And so those two examples I just gave are examples where we, the Christian, should focus on what the Lord has said and believe it. Believe it, and not let our reason and judgments and opinions get in the way Back to the spit miracle. It looks gross, it looks disgusting, but this is the way the Lord has chosen to work this miracle for this person. Who are we to sit here and chastise and tear it apart? And if we have that attitude looking at something like the sacrament, it would go a long way in the Church. This is what God is doing, this is how He has chosen to work, and so it must be good, even if our own sensibilities are offended by it or we have a different opinion of the matter. You know, I was thinking, too, about this uh, on the break, about, you know, back to the spit, and just it's a little on the disgusting side. And then I thought about the Old Testament sacrificial system, mm. where you read a book like Leviticus, and there the blood, the gore, the entrails, it's discussed on a whole level far above and beyond even spit. And when I was thinking about the sacrif- uh, sacrificial system and just the bloodiness of it all, I began to think, you know what, the this, this spit's really not that bad. <laughs> you know, it's not as bloody as seeing the entrails of an animal, you know, or a priest grab an animal and just slit the throat and all the blood pours out everywhere, okay? And, you know, we can be critical of that. We can look at that and say, that's bloody, that's disgusting, and yet, hold on a second. This is how God decreed sacrifices should take place in Leviticus. And this is what God would say you have upon making this sacrifice. You are right with him, and you can go in peace because you have sacrificed. Following the instructions, following my word is what it boils down to. The people were being faithful to the word of God and responding in the faith that he supplied. So, you know, we've we've got these lessons in Scripture where the Lord does something, works in a way that makes us scratch our head. And yet, you know, Isaiah says it uh, quite well. His ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And we've got to keep that in mind before we arrogate ourselves to think we know better when, in fact, we don't. And all of that comes back to what we were talking about with the matter of going outside the village and, and perhaps pointing us forward to what Christ does outside the city of Jerusalem. Uh, there is the ultimate scandalous action of God that, to our sensibilities, what do you mean that the salvation of the world comes through a man hanging dead on the cross? And yet, that's precisely the way he chooses to work our salvation, such that Paul, is, as you brought out from 1 Corinthians, you know, Christ crucified, that's what we preached. That is the power of God, that's the wisdom of God for our salvation. In, in what looks to our eyes just horrible, that is God's goodness and mercy and grace being poured out upon us for our very salvation. And he has spoken and we say, amen. Oh, man, I'm, I'm so, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled you brought that up. Christ and him crucified, the gore of the crucifixion. I mean, we as Christians cannot be numb to that, and we, we, we really shouldn't turn away. The centurion 
is a good example when he says, behold, truly this was the Son of God. Um, that should be our confession as well. And we shouldn't shy from the crucifix, but look at the, at the dead Christ on the cross and say, that, that is our God. That is the one who came, who died. And once again, it's easy there. It's easy there at that moment to, to question, to wonder, why did God do it this way, and so forth. But what has God said? What does Jesus say about his crucifixion? What do the scriptures say? What does God say about holy blood shed for sin? And that's what should form uh, certainly our faith, the faith that comes from hearing that word, but our thoughts, what we confess. Again, what has God said about these things? And when we look at the atonement, we hear the proclamation that because of that act, our sin, our sin is covered, put away, and we are forgiven in the sight of our Lord and our God. Now back to the, the text here in Mark chapter 8. Jesus spits on the man's eyes. He puts his hands on him. We've seen Jesus do things like this before. Uh, but then as the text continues, this is where things get a little different. We haven't really seen this before. Jesus asks him, do you see anything? And his response is, well, sort of. And and the way the text reads, I see men, but they look like trees walking. So there's, I think there's several things we could talk about here, Pastor Agrotowitz. One is, well, Jesus, how did how, this guy who sees, first of all, how does he really know what a tree would look like? He hasn't seen them before. That that seems kind of strange. Is there any significance to the fact that this is what he sees? And then probably most important, at least in my mind, is well, why why does it not? And I'm putting air quotes here. Work. Why is there this sort of partial healing in between the the fullness of this man regaining sight? So feel free to pick up any of those. Sure, sure. Well, I will start by saying that it is not it is not this. It is not that Jesus has trouble performing the miracle the first time, and so he has to try again. And I've heard that interpretation before, and. Uh, I reject it on a number of levels, because I think there's so much more going on here. And if that's what you settle to say, well, you know, God incarnate just has a little trouble pulling off the miracle. Um, I, I don't buy that for a number of reasons. Uh, namely, I think there's a lot more going on here we need to pay attention to. And that takes us to the question of the trees. You know, why does he see trees first? And as you and I were chatting about, the, the commentaries, at least the ones that we consulted, didn't really yield a whole lot on this, but I think there are some clues in the text that can that can help us figure this out. And the one clue is when it talks about his eyes. So in verse 23, he spits on his eyes. We've covered that. And the word right there for eye in the in the in the Greek is different from the other word from eye that's going to occur in 25. Two different words, and that should always you know, get an exegete's attention. Why Why two different words back to back? And, you know, when you look at these terms, these words, and, and try to get some definition behind them, they can have some shades of meaning. And this first word for eye in verse 23 uh, has been used in classical usage to mean eyes of the soul, this figurative seeing, not necessarily this physical sight, but something more internal and even spiritual. So if we, if we kind of file that away for the moment, okay, the eyes of the soul, and what might that mean? And we we connect that to the trees. What does it mean to see men as trees? So I did a word search. I put in tree just to see what I would find. The New Testament yields some very interesting things. I have a concordance cracked open before me, uh, an English concordance that you know any reader can look through. And if you look at the word tree, you find it occurs a, a lot in, in Luke, but mostly in Matthew. And so if you want to hear some good tree metaphors, read the Gospel of Matthew. Mainly, I would say, in Matthew 7, beginning at verse 17, where the Lord talks about a good tree bearing good fruit. Um, and so he's comparing people to these living organisms and the fruit that they bear. It, it's a wonderful, wonderful, simple way to talk about the relationship between good works and and your identity, your faith in Christ. So the the idea of seeing men as trees, by the time you get to Mark and you've read Matthew, uh, you've heard plenty of times God make that comparison. And it is an understanding of how we are before God 
when you when you see ourselves as trees and you start asking what does that mean um, to hear Jesus words and believe them means you understand that we're not we as people we're not a mass of organisms and tissues who have evolved over time but we have a real place quorum deo in the presence of god and the question we need to ask are we the good trees or are we the bad trees and The other question, you know, if we believe we are good trees, how can we get good fruits? And then, of course, chasing those questions down and answering in a biblical sound way. So it does sound like here that this seeing, the the first time, the first time, part one of the miracle, I mean, for lack of a better phrase, the first part of it, this man might have been given something beyond just this physical sight, but even the sight to see with faith of who men really are. We're walking trees in the sense that we're walking before God, and we're bearing fruit that he sees. And then in the next, the next part, of course, his sight is clarified, and he can see clearly. Um, all these indicators, strongly suggestion, su- suggesting, in my opinion, this man received more than just a physical sight, but even the faith to see God and to see us how we are, that we do, we do exist before God, either as good trees or bad trees, and the fruits, the fruits are there, but are they rotten fruits? Are they good fruits? And and then, of course, you know, trying to answer answer the question. Well, then, how are we going to be a good tree, and how are we going to to bear the good fruit? And of course, the answer is uh, living by faith. Living by faith, and the the faith I'm talking about here is the faith that God gives. It actually does produce things, produces good fruits according to God's gracious will and pleasure, some 30, some 60, some 100, the trees are going to look different, but the fruits are brought forth by God in those who have been given that faith to believe and trust in Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Hmm. Uh, That word that you mentioned in verse 23 for eyes, which is distinct and really a more poetic word for eyes, that's where it typically would occur is in poetic context, I think is, is important to see so that we do recognize that Again, Jesus giving this man his sight is a wonderful thing in and of itself, but that in the way that he does it and the way that Mark records it like that, it does invite us to consider what else is being taught here. And so the, mm-hmm. the ability to see spiritually, I think, is, is definitely in view here, particularly with what has been happening and what will continue to happen with Jesus' own disciples. Again, the the question that Jesus asks at the end of the previous text is of his disciples, do you not yet understand? Which isn't the exact same question that he asks this blind man here, but they're certainly related. Do you see anything? At the end of the previous text, we were kind of left, well, do you not yet understand? And, and the disciples, yeah, they, they really don't understand. Here, you've got a blind man who, when asked first if he can see anything, is like, well, sort of. And of course, Jesus is going to to heal him fully, and he's going to be able to see everything clearly, I think invites a, a measure of hope for those seemingly hopeless disciples. And even as the narrative will continue in Mark, there's going to be more moments where the disciples, you're going to, you're going to see them and they're not looking too good. You know, they're not up on that pedestal that we often will place them. And not again, not that that's wrong to think of, of Jesus' disciples in a, a particularly important way, but we're going to see their their sins and their unbelief in full force as the gospel continues. Seeing this, I, th- I think it almost provides a picture of what those disciples are going through as they come to, to fully see Jesus, which is what we've already said, they're not going to fully see Jesus until they get to the point of the cross and he's confessed to be the son of God there. And then it's like, oh, now my eyes are fully opened and I can actually see Jesus for who he is. All all of that is to say that in this text, I think part of what Jesus is doing is giving us a picture of, of what it looks like for his disciples to learn who he is here in the gospel of Mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it takes time. And if there is a gospel that really highlights the blunders of the disciples, (laughs) You know, I would say it is the Gospel of Mark. It it just doesn't try to hide that fact. And so the comparison here we are making that just as the blind man, you know, kind of sees, kind of doesn't the first go around, but then at the end of the miracle he does see, there's a comparison to be had with the disciples who they're following Jesus, they're hearing his attention, they're hearing his teaching, um, and, and he has their attention. Right when you think they're about to get it, they they just don't. 
you know, and there is this, as they follow him, uh, it's like, it's kind of like being the seminary student, you know, <laughs> you, you think you got it, but then you realize you don't have it. And there's a learning process. There's a learning curve. There's going to be trips. There's going to be some stumbles and there's going to be times when the disciples, you know, a, a, again, they're still trying to figure things out. And it's not till after the resurrection, especially Pentecost, when the public pro- proclamation goes full bore, and you see Peter with boldness and courage, he's preaching. And, you know, I've often thought, reading the biblical text, that Peter really is a different guy after Pentecost. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's, he's always been zealous. He's always kind of been on the front of things. But now he's just preaching. He's bold. He's not hiding in a locked room. But the Spirit has descended upon him, just as the Lord had promised. And after the resurrection, that's when the proclamation is really going to pick up steam and go forth. But as we're going through Mark, you see many times, one being that I mentioned, where Peter one moment confesses, yes, you are the Christ, and the very next moment he's called Satan. And and that also, too, you know, I I think mirrors our lives as Christians, where one moment we're doing pretty good. We're being faithful, we're saying the right thing, and yet the next day it just doesn't take much for us to fall. Uh, the, The petition... Lead, lead us not into temptation, is one that Christians need to pray every day. I was uh, teaching religion this morning, and we were talking about Solomon, okay? The wisest of the wise. And then we get to the point in First Kings where it talks about how many wives he had, you know? And it's, it's 700 wives and princesses and 300 concubines. And I, I, I'd made a big deal about his wisdom, and the Scriptures make a big deal about it. And this one student, you know, she's a bright student, she says, well, if he's so wise... Why did he fall away? <laughs> you know, and it was such a simple, childlike, yet such an important question. You know, how could someone so wise, you know, fall away from the faith? And look, the answer also is pretty clear. Well, you know, as wise as as the Lord you know, chooses some of us to be, there's always the sinful flesh in this life before glory. That's always a threat. Then there is the devil. And you have the world and its temptations, and there are just so many things that we are up against that one moment we have it and we're being faithful, but we always have to be on guard because the very next moment we could be in the clutches of Satan and we're crying out with the psalmist, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. So um, lots here to talk about in the sense of, you know, seeing, not seeing, you're, you know, you're doing pretty good one moment and your walk with Christ, but doing very bad the next. And that, that really is a synopsis of the Christian life. Right. It's it's not just the the third-year vicar coming back for his fourth year of seminary who thinks he knows everything, but it's it's the pastor who's served for oh, almost 11 years now who who has these moments, <laughs> right? Or or the Christian, however long you've been one, that, that right. yeah, exactly. I mean, this is this is a, an experience of, of the Christian life. And as you were talking about it, I was reminded of, St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 talks about, you know, now we see through a, a mirror darkly, or it's translated in a variety of ways, you know, then we will see face to face that that our sight, you know, I mean, right now, how do we see clearly? It's, it's always when we look through the lens of Christ crucified and risen, looking forward to that day when we will actually see him face to face, and then the any residual blindness will be fully gone. That's a good text to bring in here. Yeah, I had not thought about that text, but that's a good one. Yeah, everything in this life is just kind of a a shadow, and we see things dimly because of our sinful flesh and so forth. Uh, I think there might be, too, some sort of connection here. You know, the transfiguration. Uh, I'm sure you're going to talk about that with another guest, but, you know, they're on this glorious— they're at this glorious— moment when the Lord transfigures and his clothes become white, and there's Moses and Elijah, and of course, Peter wants them to stay. I mean, who wouldn't? Let's build some tents, and then it goes away. You know, I, I, well, I guess I should say the, the, the cloud comes and God speaks, but then the moment is over, and they have to come down the mountain, and they have to go through their work, and they will suffer, and there's going to be pain, and that's our life as well. I mean, before we get to the mountain, so to speak, there's a lot we have to go for, go through, and we're seeing things dimly, but one day we will see we will see our Lord face to face. We we long for that moment. Pastor Grotto, so we got about five minutes here to to try to bring things together. We've seen the actual miracle take place. Jesus, do you see anything? There's this partial sight. Then Jesus lays his hands on his eyes again. He 
opens them and there his sight is restored in fullness. And then we come back to that theme that you brought up at the beginning and you said there was more to say. Jesus sends this man home, but he also says, don't enter the village. We have that command to be quiet about it. Again, with about five minutes, take us into that and help us to wrap things up this morning. Sure. Well, you know, that's often termed the uh, the messianic secret. This theme in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus doesn't want his identity to be made known. And even there, sometimes, yeah, and more than one occasion, that's how the Lord operates. But, you know, in Mark chapter 5, he heals a man who's demon-possessed. And at the end, he says, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord he has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So there it seems the Lord wants him to tell people about it. He does say, go home. But, I mean, to your friends, it, it, it's, it's certainly different from our Lord when he tells people to be quiet. But I, I, don't, I don't think the answer here is too, too hard to find. A, we've seen, as I mentioned earlier, responses from the crowds where they just really erupt into a frenzy. And on one occasion, Jesus could even go in the village to preach. And that's unfortunate, because in Mark chapter 1, he says, uh, Let us go into the next towns, and I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. When you can't preach and the word can't go forth, that's a real unfortunate circumstance to find one in. So by Jesus telling people not to say things, uh, it does seem like in quite a few cases it's because he doesn't want the crowds to get the wrong idea. Ultimately, the signs and miracles are to point to the divinity of Jesus and what he has come to do, which is save humanity by dying on a cross outside of Jerusalem. And the proclamation, the full proclamation of who Christ is, must include those things, his death, his resurrection, and what that means, and Pentecost onward, you're going to see that proclamation really go out full bore, beginning with the disciples and going on from there throughout the ages. So the idea to be quiet, not to go tell, we've seen what happens in Mark when people do, and people just get a little too excited. But again, we're we're getting back to the idea of the proclamation's going to go out, Jesus doesn't need any help. He needs to go to the cross. He wants to go to the cross. He is going to do that. His eyes are fixated on accomplishing that task, and not even you know, excited crowds are going to thwart him from doing that. And so once he gets there, truly you are the Son of God. It will, of course, rise from the dead in the third day, and then, then it will be time for the preaching to go forward, and blessed are those who believe without seeing. And we're going to see that happen, and it still happens today. So there is some anticipation in Mark in this building up, and be quiet, be quiet, because the time to speak isn't quite yet, but it's going to come. It's going to come, it's going to, and it's come after he has risen from the dead, and uh, humanity, the entire world, atoned for by his blood, and we can preach that glorious resurrection that though we die, we live because our Lord lives. Mm. And in that preaching, then, people are brought to faith, and in that faith, they see. They see clearly. As you said, blessed are those who believe and have not seen. And yet, in that very believing, they do see. They see who Jesus is. Pastor Ryan Agrotowitz serves as the associate pastor and headmaster at Grace Lutheran Church and School in Brenham, Texas, helping us this morning with Mark chapter 8, verses 22 to 26. Pastor Agrotowitz, thanks for being our guest today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you have questions about Mark chapter 8 or any of the gospel according to St. Mark, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. We love to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.